Section 16 of The Oxford Book of American Essays, chosen by Brander Matthews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 16. The Theatre Francais has, moreover, the right to do as Moliere did, to claim its property wherever it finds it. It may stretch out its long arm and break the engagement of a promising actor at any of the other theatres, of course after a certain amount of notice given. So last winter it notified to the gymnase its design of appropriating worms, the admirable Jeune Premier, who, returning from a long sojourn in Russia and taking the town by surprise, had begun to retrieve the shrunken fortunes of that establishment. On the whole, it may be said that the great talents find their way, sooner or later, to the Théâtre Francais. This is, of course, not a rule that works unvaryingly, for there are a great many influences to interfere with it, interest as well as merit, especially in the case of the actresses, weighs in the scale, and the ire that may exist in celestial minds has been known to manifest itself in the councils of the Comédie. Moreover, a brilliant actress may prefer to reign supreme at one of the smaller theatres. At the Francais, inevitably, she shares her dominion. The honour is less, but the comfort is greater. Nevertheless, at the Francais, in a general way, there is in each case a tolerably obvious artistic reason for membership. And if you see a clever actor remain outside for years, you may be pretty sure that, though private reasons count, there are artistic reasons as well. The first half-dozen times I saw Mademoiselle Hargui, who for years ruled the roost, as the vulgar saying is, at the vaudeville, I wondered that so consummate and accomplished an actress should not have a place at the first French stage but I presently grew wiser and perceived that, clever as Mademoiselle Froggy is, she is not for the Rue de Richelieu, but for the Boulevard. Her peculiar, intensely Parisienne intonation would sound out of place in the Maison de la Mer. Of course, if Mademoiselle Fegu has ever received overtures from the Francais, my sagacity is at fault. I am looking through a millstone but I suspect she has not. Frédéric Lemaitre, who died last winter and who was a very great actor, had been tried at the Francais and found wanting for those particular conditions, but it may probably be said that if Frédéric was wanting, the theatre was too, in this case. Frédéric's great force was his extravagance, his fantasticality, and the stage of the Rue de Richelieu was a trifle too academic. I have even wondered whether Desclay, if she had lived, would have trod that stage by right, and whether it would have seemed her proper element. The negative is not impossible. It is very possible that in that classic atmosphere her great charm, her intensely modern quality, her super-subtle realism would have appeared an anomaly. I can imagine even that her strange, touching, nervous voice would not have seemed the voice of the house. At the Francais, you must know how to acquit yourself of a tirade that has always been the touchstone of capacity. It would probably have proved Desclay's stumbling block, though she could utter speeches of six words as no one else surely has ever done. It is true that Mademoiselle Croisette and, in a certain sense, Mademoiselle Sarah Bernhard are rather weak at their tirades. But then old theatre-goers will tell you that these young ladies, in spite of a hundred attractions, have no business at the Francais. In the course of time the susceptible foreigner passes from that superstitious state of attention which I just now sketched to that greater enlightenment which enables him to understand such a judgment as this of the old theatre-goers. It is borne in upon him that, as the good Homer sometimes nods, the Théâtre Francais sometimes lapses from its high standard. 
he makes various reflections he thinks that mademoiselle faver rants he thinks monsieur mounet souli in spite of his delicious voice insupportable he thinks that monsieur paladis five-act tragedy rome vacu presented in the early part of the present winter was better done certainly than it would have been done upon any english stage but by no means so much better done as might have been expected here if i had space i would open a long parenthesis in which i should aspire to demonstrate that the incontestable superiority of average french acting to english is by no means so strongly marked in tragedy as in comedy is indeed sometimes not strongly marked at all the reason of this is in a great measure i think that we have had shakespeare to exercise ourselves upon and that an inferior dramatic instinct exercised upon shakespeare may become more flexible than a superior one exercised upon coni and Racine. when it comes to ranting ranting even in a modified and comparatively reasonable sense we do i suspect quite as well as the french if not rather better mr g h lewes in his entertaining little book upon actors and the art of acting mentions m talbot of the francais as a surprisingly incompetent performer my memory assents to his judgment at the same time that it proposes an amendment this actor's special line is the buffeted bemuddled besotted old fathers uncles and guardians of classic comedy and he plays them with his face much more than with his tongue nature has endowed him with a visage so admirably adapted once for all to his role that he has only to sit in a chair with his hands folded on his stomach to look like a monument of bewildered senility after that it does not matter what he says or how he says it the comedie francaise sometimes does weaker things than in keeping m talbot last autumn eighteen seventy six for instance it was really depressing to see mademoiselle dudley brought all the way from brussels and with not a little flourish either to create the guilty vestal in rome vacuum as far as the interests of art are concerned mademoiselle dudley had much better have remained in the flemish capital of whose language she is apparently a perfect mistress it is hard to f to forgive m perrin m perrin is the present director of the theatre francais for bringing out la mifrie of m ecmont chatrain the two gentlemen who write under this name have a double claim to kindness in the first place they have produced some delightful little novels every one knows and admires le conscrit de 1813 every one admires indeed the charming tale on which the play in question is founded in the second place they were before the production of their piece the objects of a scurrilous attack by the figaro newspaper which held the authors up to reprobation for having insulted the army and did its best to lay the train for a hostile manifestation on the first night it may be added that the good sense of the public outbalanced the impudence of the newspaper and the play was simply advertised into success but neither the novels nor the persecutions of m ecmont chatrain availed to render la mifrie in its would-be dramatic form worthy of the first french stage it is played as well as possible and upholstered even better but it is according to the vulgar phrase too thin for the locality upholstery has never played such a part at the theatre francais as during the reign of m perrin who came into power if i mistake not after the late war he proved very early that he was a radical and he has introduced a hundred novelties his administration however has been brilliant and in his hands the theatre francais has made money this it had rarely done before and this in the 
conservative view is quite beneath its dignity to the conservative view i should humbly incline an institution so closely protected by a rich and powerful state ought to be able to cultivate art for art the first of m sancy's biographies to which i have been too long in coming is devoted to regnier a veteran actor who left the stage four or five years since and who now fills the office of oracle to his younger comrades it is the indispensable thing says m sancy for a young aspirant to be able to say that he has had lessons of m regnier or that m regnier has advised him or that he has talked such and such a point over with m regnier his comrades always speak of him as m regnier never as simple regnier i have had the fortune to see him but once it was the first time i ever went to the theatre francais he played don annibal in emile augure's romantic comedy of l'aventurier and i have not forgotten the exquisite humour of the performance the part is that of a sort of seventeenth-century captain costigan only the miss fotheringay in the case is the gentleman's sister and not his daughter this lady is moreover an ambitious and designing person who leads her threadbare braggart of a brother quite by the nose she has entrapped a worthy gentleman of padua of mature years and he is on the eve of making her his wife when his son a clever young soldier beguiles don annibal into supporting with him and makes him drink so deep that the prating adventurer at last lets the cat out of the bag and confides to his companion that the fair chlorinde is not the virtuous gentlewoman she appears but a poor strolling actress who has had a lover at every stage of her journey the scene was played by bresson and regnier and it has always remained in my mind as one of the most perfect things i have seen on the stage the gradual action of the wine upon don annibal the delicacy with which his deepening tipsiness was indicated its intellectual rather than physical manifestation and in the midst of it the fantastic conceit which made him think that he was winding his fellow-drinker round his fingers all this was exquisitely rendered drunkenness on the stage is usually both dreary and disgusting and i can remember besides this but two really interesting pictures of intoxication excepting always indeed the immortal tipsiness of cassio in othello which a clever actor can always make touching one is the beautiful befuddlement of rip van winkle as mr joseph jefferson renders it and the other a memory of the theatre francais the scene in the duc job in which go succumbs to mild inebriation and dozes in his chair just boozily enough for the young girl who loves him to make it out it is to this admirable emile go that m sancy's second notice is devoted go is at the present hour unquestionably the first actor at the theatre francais and i have personally no hesitation in accepting him as the first of living actors his younger comrade coquelin has i think as much talent and as much art as the older man go has the longer and fuller record and may therefore be spoken of as the master if i were obliged to rank the half-dozen premier souillets of the last few years at the, the theatre francais in their absolute order of talent thank heaven i am not so obliged i think i should make up some such little list as this go coquelin madame plessis sarah brahant mademoiselle faver doulanay i confess that i have no sooner written it than i feel as if i ought to amend it and wonder whether it is not a great folly to put delaunay after mademoiselle faver but this is idle as for go he is a singularly interesting actor i have often wondered whether the best definition of him would not be to say that he is really a philosophic actor 
He is an immense humorist, and his comicality is sometimes colossal. But his most striking quality is the one on which M. Sarcy dwells, his sobriety and profundity, his underlying element of manliness and melancholy, the impression he gives you of having a general conception of human life, and of seeing the relativity, as one may say, of the character he represents. Of all the comic actors I have seen, he is the least trivial. At the same time that for richness of detail his comic manner is unsurpassed. His repertory is very large and various, but it may be divided into two equal halves, the parts that belong to reality and the parts that belong to fantasy. There is, of course, a great deal of fantasy in his realistic parts and a great deal of reality in his fantastic ones, but the general division is just, and at times, indeed, the two faces of his talent seems to have little in common. The Duke Job to which i just now alluded is one of the things he does most perfectly the part which is that of a young man is a serious and tender one it is amazing that the actor who plays it should also be able to carry off triumphantly the frantic buffoonery of maitre patelin or should represent the sanguinel of the medecin magre louis which such an unctuous breath of humour the two characters, perhaps, which have given me the liveliest idea of Gaud's power and fertility are the Maitre Patelin and the Monsieur Poirier, who figures in the title to the comedy which Émile Augier and Jules Sandeau wrote together. Monsieur Poirier, the retired shopkeeper, who marries his daughter to a marquis and makes acquaintance with the incommodities incidental to such a piece of luck, is perhaps the actor's most elaborate creation. It is difficult to see how the portrayal of a type and an individual can have a larger sweep and a more minute completeness. The bonhomme Poirier in Gaud's hands is really great, and half a dozen of the actor's modern parts that I could mention are hardly less brilliant but when i think of him i instinctively think first of some role in which he wears the cap and gown of a period as regards which humorous invention may fairly take the bit in its teeth this is what go lets it do in maitre patelin and he leads the spectator's exhilarated fancy a dance to which the latter's aching sides on the morrow sufficiently testify the piece is a rechauffe of a medieval farce which has the credit of being the first play not a mystery or a miracle piece in the records of the french drama the plot is extremely bald and primitive it sets forth how a cunning lawyer undertook to purchase a dozen ells of cloth for nothing in the first scene we see him in the market-place bargaining and haggling with the draper and then marching off with the roll of cloth with the understanding that the shopman shall call at his house in the course of an hour for the money. In the next act, we have Maitre Patelin in his fireside with his wife, to whom he relates his trick and its projected sequel, and who greets them with Homeric laughter. He gets into bed, and the innocent draper arrives. Then follows a scene of which the liveliest description must be ineffective. Patelin pretends to be out of his head, to be overtaken by a mysterious malady which has made him delirious, not to know the draper from Adam, never to have heard of the dozen ells of cloth, and to be altogether an impossible person to collect a debt from. To carry out this character he indulges in a series of indescribable antics, out bedlam's bedlam frolics over the room dressed out in the bedclothes and chanting the wildest gibberish bewilders the poor draper to within an inch of his own sanity and finally puts him utterly to rout the spectacle could only be portentously flat or heroically successful and in go's hands this latter was its fortune his sanguinel in the medecin malgré louis and half a dozen of his characters from Moliere besides, such a part too as his tibia in Alfred de Musset's 
charming bit of romanticism, the caprice de Marianne, have a certain generic resemblance with his treatment of the figure I have sketched. In all these things the comicality is of the exuberant and tremendous order, and yet in spite of its richness and flexibility it suggests little connection with high animal spirits. It seems a matter of invention, of reflection and irony. You cannot imagine go representing a fool pure and simple, or at least a passive and unsuspecting fool. There must always be an element of shrewdness and even of contempt. He must be the man who knows and judges, or at least who pretends. It is a compliment, I take it, to an actor to say that he prompts you to wonder about his private personality, and an observant spectator of M. Go is at liberty to guess that he is both obstinate and proud. In Coquelin there is perhaps greater spontaneity, and there is not inferior mastery of his art. He is a wonderfully brilliant, elastic actor. He is but thirty-five years old, and yet his record is most glorious. He too has his actual and his classical repertory, and here also it is hard to choose. As the young valet de comédie in Moliere and Regnard and Marivaux, he is incomparable. I shall never forget the really infernal brilliancy of his mascarilla in Le Tourdi. His volubility, his rapidity, his impudence and gaiety, his ringing, penetrating voice, and the shrill trumpet note of his laughter make him the ideal of the classic serving man of the classic young lover, half rascal and half good fellow. Coquelin has lately had two or three immense successes in the comedies of the day. His Duc de la Septemont in the famous Entragère of Alexandre Dumas last winter was the capital creation of the piece. And in the revival this winter of Augier's Paul Faustier, his Adolphe de Beaubourg, the young man about town, consciously tainted with commonness, and trying to shake off the incubus, seemed while one watched it and listened to it the last word of delicately humorous art. Of Coquelin's eminence in the old comedies, M. Sassy speaks with a certain pictorial force. No one is better cut out to represent those bold and magnificent rascals of the old repertory, with their boisterous gaiety, their brilliant fancy, and their superb extravagance, who give to their buffoonery je ne sais quoi de pique. In these parts one may say of Coquelin that he is incomparable. I prefer him to go in such cases, and even to Regnier, his master. I never saw Monrose, and I cannot speak of him, but good judges have assured me that there was much that was factitious in the manner of this eminent comedian, and that his vivacity was a trifle mechanical. There is nothing whatever of this in Coquelin's manner. The eye, the nose, and the voice, the voice above all, are his most powerful means of action. He launches his tirade all in one breath, with full lungs, without troubling himself too much over the shading of details in large masses, and he possesses himself only the more strongly of the public, which has a great sense of ensemble. The words that must be detached, the words that must decisively tell, glitter in this delivery with the sonorous ring of a brand new Louis Dure. Crispin, Scarpin, Figaro, Mascarilla have never found a more valiant and joyous interpreter. I should say that this was enough about the men at the Théâtre Français if I did not remember that I have not spoken of Delaunay. But Delaunay has plenty of people to speak for him. He has, in especial, the more eloquent half of humanity, the ladies. I suppose that of all the actors of the Comédie Française he is the most universally appreciated and admired. He is the popular favorite and he has certainly earned this distinction, for there was never a more amiable and sympathetic genius. 
he plays the young lovers of the past and the present and he acquits himself of his difficult and delicate task with extraordinary grace and propriety the danger i spoke of a while since the danger for the actor of a romantic and sentimental part of being compromised by the coat and trousers the hat and umbrella of the current year are reduced by delaunay to their minimum he reconciles in a marvellous fashion the lovesick gallant of the ideal world with the gentlemanly man of to-day and his passion is as far removed from rant as his propriety is from stiffness he has been accused of late years of falling into mannerism and i think there is some truth in the charge but the fault in delaunay's situation is certainly venial how can a man of fifty to whom as regards face and figure nature has been stingy play an amorous swain of twenty without taking refuge in a mannerism his mannerism is a legitimate device for diverting the spectator's attention from certain incongruities delaunay's juvenility his ardour his passion his good taste and sense of fitness have always an irresistible charm as he has grown older he has increased his repertory by parts of greater weight and sobriety he has played the husbands as well as the lovers one of his most recent and brilliant creations of this kind is his marquis de presse in the legendre de la monsieur poirier a piece of acting superb for its lightness and dissolubre it cannot be better praised than by saying it was worthy of Gough's inimitable rendering of the part opposed to it. But I think I shall remember Delaunay's best in the picturesque and romantic comedies, as the Duc de Richelieu in Mademoiselle de Belleisle, as the joyous, gallant, exuberant young hero, his plumes and love-knots fluttering in the breath of his gushing improvisation of cornille's menteur or most of all as the melodious swains of those charmingly poetic faintly naturally shakespearean little comedies of alfred de musset to speak of delaunay ought to bring us properly to mademoiselle faver who for so many years invariably represented the object of his tender invocations mademoiselle Fauvert, at the present time rather lacks what the french call actuality she has recently made an attempt to recover something of that large measure of it which she once possessed but i doubt whether it has been completely successful m sarcy has not yet put forth his notice of her and when he does so it will be interesting to see how he treats her she is not one of his high admirations she is a great talent that has passed into eclipse i call her a great talent although i remember the words in which m sarcy somewhere speaks of her mademoiselle faver who to happy natural gifts soutenu par un travail acané owed a distinguished place etc her talent is great but the impression that she gives of a travail a canet and of an insatiable ambition is perhaps even greater for many years she reigned supreme and i believe she is accused of not having always reigned generously however that may be there came a day when mademoiselles croisette and sarah bernhardt passed to the front and the elder actress receded if not into the background at least into what painters call the middle distance the private history of these events has i believe been rich in heart burnings but it is only with the public history that we are concerned mademoiselle faver has always seemed to me a powerful rather than an interesting actress there is usually something mechanical and overdone in her manner in some of her parts there is a kind of audible creaking of the machinery if delaunay is open to the reproach of having let a mannerism get the better of him this accusation is much more fatally true of mademoiselle faver 
On the other hand, she knows her trade as no one does, no one at least save Madame Plessy. When she is bad, she is extremely bad, and sometimes she is uninterruptedly bad for a whole evening. In the revival of Scribe's clever comedy of Une Chain, this winter, which, by the way, though the cast included both Go and Coquelin, was the nearest approach to mediocrity I have ever seen at the Théâtre Français, Mademoiselle Favre was, to my sense, startlingly bad. The part had originally been played by Madame Plessy, and I remember how M. Sarcy in his Fetelton treated its actual representative. Mademoiselle Favre does Louise, who does not recall the exquisite delicacy and temperance with which Mademoiselle Plessy rendered that difficult scene in the second act, etc., and nothing more. When, however, Mademoiselle Favre is at her best, she is remarkably strong. She rises to great occasions. I doubt whether such parts as the desperate heroine of the Supplice d'une Femme, or as Julie in Octave Fouillet's lugubrious drama of that name, could be more effectively played than she plays them. She can carry a great weight without flinching. She has what the French call authority, and in declamation she sometimes rolls her fine voice, as it were, in long harmonious waves and cadences, the sustained power of which her younger rivals must often envy her. I am drawing to the close of these rather desultory observations without having spoken of the four ladies commemorated by M. Saucy in the publication which lies before me, and I do not know that I can justify my tardiness otherwise than by saying that writing and reading about artists of so extreme a personal brilliancy is poor work, and that the best a critic can do is to wish his reader may see them from a quiet Fauteuil as speedily and as often as possible. Of Madeleine Brohan, indeed, there is little to say. She is a delightful person to listen to, and she is still delightful to look at, in spite of that redundancy of contour which time has contributed to her charms. But she has never been ambitious, and her talent has had no particularly original quality. It is a long time since she created an important part, but in the old repertory her rich, dense voice, her charming smile, her mellow, tranquil gaiety always gives extreme pleasure. To hear her sit and talk, simply and laugh, and play with her fan, along with Madame Plessy in Molière's Critique des Cols des Femmes, is an entertainment to be remembered. For Madame Plessy, I should have to mend my pen and begin a new chapter, and for Mademoiselle Sarah Bernhardt, no less a ceremony would suffice. I saw Madame Plessy for the first time in Emile Augier's Aventure, when, as I mentioned, I first saw Renier. This is considered by many persons her best part, and she certainly carries it off with a high hand but I like her better in characters which afford more scope to her talents for comedy. These characters are very numerous, for her activity and versatility have been extraordinary. Her comedy, of course, is high. It is of the highest conceivable kind, and she has often been accused of being too mincing and too artificial. I should never make this charge, for to me, Madame Plessis, Menardieres, her grand airs and her arched refinements have never been anything but the odorous swayings and queenly tossings of some splendid garden flower. Never had an actress grander manners. When Madame Plessy represents a duchess, you have no allowances to make. Her limitations are on the side of the pathetic. If she is brilliant, she is cold, and I cannot imagine her touching the source of tears but she is in the highest degree accomplished. She gives an impression of intelligence and intellect which is produced by none of her companions, except always the extremely exceptional Sarah Bernhardt. Madame Plessy's intellect has sometimes misled her, 
as for instance when it whispered to her a few years since that she could play agrippine in racine's britannicus on that tragedy being presented for the debut of mounet sully i was verdant enough to think her agrippine very fine but m sarcy reminds his readers of what he said of it the monday after the first performance i will not say he quotes himself that madame plessy is indifferent with her intelligence her natural gifts her great situation her immense authority over the public one cannot be indifferent in anything she is therefore not indifferently bad she is bad to the point that cannot be expressed and that would be distressing for dramatic art if it were not that in this great shipwreck there rise to the surface a few floating fragments of the finest qualities that nature has ever bestowed upon an artist madame plessy retired from the stage six months ago and it may be said that the void produced by this event is irreparable there is not only no prospect but there is no hope of filling it up the present conditions of artistic production are directly hostile to the formation of actresses as consummate and as complete as madame plessy one may not expect to see her like any more than one may expect to see a new manufacture of old lace and old brocade she carried off with her something that the younger generation of actresses will consistently lack a certain largeness of style and robustness of art these qualities are in a modified degree those of mademoiselle Faver but if the younger actresses have the success of mademoiselle crozette and sarah bernard will they greatly care whether they are not robust these young ladies are children of a later and eminently contemporary type according to which an actress undertakes not to interest but to fascinate they are charming awfully charming strange eccentric imaginative it would be needless to speak specifically of mademoiselle croisette for although she has very great attractions i think she may by the cold impartiality of science be classified as a secondary a less inspired and to use the great word of the day a more brutal sarah bernard mademoiselle croisette brutality is her great card as for mademoiselle sarah bernhardt she is simply at present in paris one of the great figures of the day it would be hard to imagine a more brilliant embodiment of feminine success she deserves a chapter for herself december eighteen seventy six theocritus on cape cod hamilton wright maybe cape cod lies at the other end of the world from sicily not only in distance but in the look of it the lay of it the way of it it is so far off that it offers a base from which one may get a fresh view of theocritus there are very pleasant villages on the cape in the wide shade of ancient elms set deep in the old-time new england quiet for there was a time before the arrival of the syrians the armenians and the automobile when new england was in a meditative mood but cape cod is really a ridge of sand with a backbone of soil rashly thrust into the atlantic and as fluent and volatile so to speak as one of those far western rivers that are shifting currents sublimely indifferent to private ownership the cape does not lack stability but it shifts its lines with easy disregard of charts and boundaries and remains stable only at its centre it is always fraying at the edges it lies too on the western edge of the ocean stream where the forces of land and sea are often at war and the palette of colours is limited the sirocco does not sift fine sand through every crevice and fill the heart of man with murderous impulses but the east wind diffuses a kind of elemental depression 
Sicily, on the other hand, is high built on rocky foundations, and is the wide spreading reach of a great volcano, sloping broadly and leisurely to the sea. It is often shaken at its centre, but the sea does not take from nor add to its substance at will. It lies in the very heart of a sea of such ravishing colour that by sheer fecundity of beauty it has given birth to a vast fellowship of gods and divinely fashioned creatures. Its slopes are white with billowy masses of almond blossoms in that earlier spring which is late winter in Cape Cod, while grey-green, gnarled, and twisted olive trees bear witness to the passionate moods of the mediterranean mother of poetry comedy and tragedy often asleep in a dream of beauty in which the shadowy figures of the oldest time move often as violent as an author atlantic when march torments it with furious moods for the mediterranean is as seductive beguiling and uncertain of temper as cleopatra as radiant as hera as voluptuous as aphrodite but in terms of colour it is as different from the sea around cape cod as a picture by sorolla is different from a picture by mauve theocritus is interested in the magic of the island rather than in the mystery of the many sounding sea and to him the familiar look of things is never edged like a photograph it is as solid and real as a report of the department of agriculture but a mist of poetry is spread over it in which as in a whistler nocturne many details harmonize in a landscape at once actual and visionary there is no example in literature of the unison of sight and vision more subtly and elusively harmonious than the report of sicily in the idols in its occupations the island was as prosaic as cape cod and lacked the far-reaching consciousness of the great world which is the possession of every populated sandbar in the western world but it was enveloped in an atmosphere in which the edges of things were lost in a sense of their rootage in poetic relations and of interrelations so elusive and immaterial that a delicate but persistent charm exhaled from them sicily was a solid and stubborn reality thousands of years before theocritus struck his pastoral lyre but its most obvious quality was atmospheric it was compacted of facts but they were seen not as a camera sees but as an artist sees not in sharp outline and hard actuality but softened by a flood of light which melts all hard lines in a landscape vibrant and shimmering our landscape painters are now reporting nature as theocritus saw her in sicily the value of the overtone matching the value of the undertone to quote an artist's phrase apply these tones in right proportions writes mr harrison and you will find that the sky painted with a perfectly matched tone will fly away indefinitely will be bathed in a perfect atmosphere we who have for a time lost the poetic mood and strayed from the poet's standpoint paint the undertones with entire fidelity but we do not paint in the overtones and the landscape loses the luminous and vibrant quality which comes into it when the sky rains light upon it we see with the accuracy of the camera we do not see with the vision of the poet in which reality is not sacrificed but subdued to larger uses we insist on the scientific fact the poet is intent on the visual fact the one gives the bare structure of the landscape the other gives us its color atmosphere charm here perhaps is the real difference between cape cod and sicily it is not so much a contrast between encircling seas and the sand ridge and rock ridge as between the two ways of seeing the scientific and the poetic the difference of soils must also be taken into account the soil of history on cape cod is almost as thin as the physical soil which is so light and detached that it is blown about by all the winds of heaven in sicily on the other hand the soil is so much a part of the substance of the island that the sirocco must 
bring from the shores of africa the fine particles with which it tortures men on cape cod there are a few colonial traditions many heroic memories of brave deeds in awful seas some records of prosperous daring in fishing ships and then the advent of the summer colonists a creditable history but of so recent date that it has not developed the fructifying power of a rich soil out of which atmosphere rises like an exhalation in sicily on the other hand the soil of history is so deep that the spade of the archaeologist has not touched bottom and even the much toiling freeman found four octavo volumes so cramped to tell the whole story and mercifully stopped at the death of agathocles since the beginning of history which means only the brief time since we began to remember events everybody has gone to sicily and most people have stayed there until they were driven on or driven out by later comers and almost everybody has been determined to keep the island for himself and set about it with an ingenuity and energy of slaughter which make the movement toward a universal peace seem pallid and nerveless it is safe to say that on no bit of ground of equal area has more history been enacted than in sicily and when theocritus was young sicily was already venerable with years and experience now history using the word as signifying things which have happened although enacted on the ground gets into the air and one often feels it before he knows it in this volatile and pervasive form it is diffused over the landscape and becomes atmospheric an atmosphere it must be remembered bears the same relation to air that the countenance bears to the face it reveals and expresses what is behind the physical features there is hardly a half mile of sicily below the upper ridges of etna that has not been fought over and the localities are few which cannot show the prints of the feet of the gods or of the heroes who were their children it was a very charming picture on which the curtain was rolled up when history began but the island was not a theatre in which men sat at ease and looked at persephone in the arms of pluto it was an arena in which race followed close upon race like the waves of the sea each rising a little higher and gaining a little wider sweep and each leaving behind not only wreckage but layers of soil potent in vitality the island was as full of strange music of haunting presences of far-off memories of tragedy as the island of the tempest it bred its calibans but it bred also its prosperos for the imagination is nourished by rich association as an artist is fed by a beautiful landscape and in sicily men grew up in an invisible world of memories that spread a heroic glamour over desolate places and kept olympus within view of the mountain pastures where rude shepherds cut their pipes a pipe discoursing through nine months i made full fair to view the wax is white thereon the line of this and that edge true the soil of history may be so rich that it nourishes all manner of noxious things side by side with flowers of glorious beauty this is the price we pay for fertility a thin soil on the other hand sends a few flowers of delicate structure and haunting fragrance into the air like the arbutus and the witchiana which express the clean dry sod of cape cod and are symbolic of the poverty and purity of its history thoreau reports that in one place he saw advertised fine sand for sale here and he ventures the suggestion that some of the street had been sifted and possibly with a little tinge of malice after his long fight with winds and shore drifts he reports that in some pictures of provincetown the persons of the inhabitants are not drawn below the ankles so much being supposed to be buried in the sand nevertheless he continues natives of 
province town assured me that they could walk in the middle of the road without trouble even in slippers for they had learned how to put their feet down and lift them up without taking in any sand on a soil so light and porous there is a plentiful harvesting of health and substantial comfort but not much chance of poetry in the country of theocritus there was great chance for poetry not because anybody was taught anything but because everybody was born in an atmosphere that was diffused poetry if this had not been true the poet could not have spread a soft mist of poesy over the whole island no man works that kind of magic unaided he compounds his portion out of simples culled from the fields round him theocritus does not disguise the rudeness of the life he describes goat-herds and he-goats are not the conventional properties of the poetic stage the poet was without a touch of the drawing-room consciousness of crude things though he knew well softness and charm of life in syracuse under a tyrant who did not patronize the arts but was instructed by them to him the distinction between poetic and unpoetic things was not in the appearance but in the root he was not ashamed of nature as he found her and he never apologized for her coarseness by avoiding things not fit for refined eyes his shepherds and goat-herds are often gross and unmannerly and as stuffed with noisy abuse as shakespeare's people in richard the third lacon and cometus rival poets of the field are having a controversy and this is the manner of their argument lacon when learned i from thy practice or thy preaching aught that's right thou puppet thou misshapen lump of ugliness in spite cometus when when i beat thee wailing sore your goats looked on with glee and bleated and were dealt with even as i had dealt with thee and then without a pause the landscape shines through the noisy talk nay here are oaks and gallingale the hum of housing bees makes the place pleasant the birds are piping in the trees and here are two cold streamlets here deeper shadows fall than young place owns and look what cones drop from the pine tree tall thoreau to press the analogy from painting a little further lays the undertones on with a firm hand it is a wild rank place and there is no flattery in it strewn with crabs horse shoes and razor clams and whatever the sea casts up a vast morgue where famished dogs may reign in packs and cows come daily to glean the pittance which the tide leaves them the carcasses of men and beasts together lie stately up upon its shelf rotting and bleaching in the sun and waves and each tide turns them in their beds and tucks fresh sand under them there is naked nature inhumanly sincere wasting no thought on man nibbling at the cliffy shore where gulls wheel amid the spray it certainly is naked nature with a vengeance and it was hardly fair to take her portrait in that condition theocritus would have shown us actaeon surprising artemis not naked but nude and there is all the difference between nakedness and nudity that yawns between a greek statue and a pompeian fresco indiscreetly preserved in the museum at naples theocritus shows nature nude but not naked and it is worth noting that the difference between the two lies in the presence or absence of consciousness in greek mythology nudity passes without note or comment the moment it begins to be noted and commented upon it becomes nakedness theocritus sees nature nude as did all the greek poets but he does not surprise her when she is naked he paints the undertones faithfully but he always lays on the overtones and so spreads the effulgence of the sky stream over the undertones
and the picture becomes vibrant and luminous. The fact is never slurred or ignored. It gets full value, but not as a solitary and detached thing, untouched by light, unmodified by the landscape. Is there a more charming impression of a landscape bathed in atmosphere, exhaling poetry, breathing in the very presence of divinity, than this in Calverley's translation? I ceased. He, smiling sweetly as before, gave me the staff, the muse's parting gift, and leftward sloped toward Pixa. We the while bent us to Frasidines, Eucretus and I, and baby-faced Amintus. There we lay half buried in a couch of fragrant reed and fresh-cut vine leaves, who so glad as we? A wealth of elm and poplar shook overhead. Hard by a sacred spring flowed gurgling on from the nymph's grot, and in the somber boughs the sweet cicada chirped laboriously. Hid in the thick thorn bushes far away, the tree frog's note was heard. The crested lark sang with a gold finch. Turtles made their moan, and o'er the fountain hung the gilded bee. All of rich summer smacked of autumn all. Pears at our feet and apples at our side rolled in luxuriance. Branches on the ground sprawled, overweighted with damsons, while we brushed from the cask's head the crust of four long years. Say ye who dwell upon Parnassian peaks, nymphs of Castilia, did old Chiron ever set before Heracles a cup so brave in Pholus's cavern? Did as Nectarus draughts cause that an apian shepherd, in whose hand rocks were as pebbles, polypheme the strong, featly to foot it o'er the cottage lawns, as ladies we bid flow that day for us all but Demeter's shrine at harvest home, beside whose corn stalks may I oft again plant my broad fan, while she stands by and smiles poppies and corn sheaves on each laden arm. Here is the landscape seen with a poet's eye, and the colour and shining quality of a landscape, it must be remembered, are in the exquisitely sensitive eye that sees, not in the structure and substance upon which it rests. The painter and poet create nature as really as they create art. For in every clear sight of the world we are not passive receivers of impressions, but partners in that creative work which makes nature as contemporaneous as the morning newspaper. It is true, Sicily was poetic in its very structure, while Cape Cod is poetic only in oases, bits of old New England shade and tracery of elms, the peace of ancient sincerity, and content honestly housed, the changing colour of marshes, in whose channels the tides are singing or mute. But the Sicily of Theocritus was seen by the poetic eye. In every complete vision of a landscape, what is behind the eye is as important as what lies before it, and behind the eyes that look at Sicily in the third century B.C. there were not only the memories of many generations, but there was also a faith in visible and invisible creatures which peopled the world with divinities. The text of Theocritus is starred with the names of gods and goddesses, of heroes and poets. It is like a rich tapestry on the surface of which history has been woven in beautiful colors. The flat surface dissolves in a vast distance, and the dull warp and woof glows with moving life. The idols are saturated with religion, and as devoid of piety as a Bernard Shore play. Gods and men differ only in their power, not at all in their character. What we call morals were as conspicuously absent from Olympus as from Sicily. In both places life and the world are taken in their obvious intention. There was no attempt, apart from the philosophers, 
who are always an inquisitive folk, to discover either the mind or the heart of things. In the Greek Bible, which Homer composed and recited to crowds of people on festive occasions, the fear of the gods and their vengeance are set forth in a text of unsurpassed force and vitality of imagination. But no god, in his most dissolute mood, betrays any moral consciousness, and no man repents of sins. That things often go wrong was as obvious then as now, but there was no sense of sin. There were Greeks who prayed, but none who put dust on their head, and beat his breast, and cried, Woe unto me, a sinner! There were disasters by land and sea, but no newspaper spread them out in shrieking type, and by skilful omission and selection of topics, bore the semblance of an official report of a madhouse. There were diseases and deaths, but patent medicine advertisements had not saturated the common mind with ominous symptoms. Old age was present with its monitions of change and decay. Age o'ertakes us all, our tempers first, then our cheek and chin, slowly and surely creep the frosts of time, up and go somewhere, ere thy limbs are sere. End of section 16